it's been cool to, to see you kind of work on different projects. And then yeah. uh, this year you seem to be killing it with Crave. So I'm excited to have you on. And I feel like I haven't really spoken to very many people who have, you know, a real world business. It's all digital. It's all SaaS. It's all um, websites and apps. But the fact that you're doing a cookie business is going to set you apart from pretty much everybody else who's come on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was always trying to kind of trying to do the, the, the SaaS or like B2B side. You know, mm-hmm. like that's that's where my experience always was, since that's you're always kind of you always cr- try to do what you what you think you're you've always done or whatever. You know, like you don't right. you don't see what what's available to you. Um, so like, just having been in you know big tech for like six years, and then mm. my sister saying that she was going to start a cookie thing with my cousin. Oh, she, or, oh yeah, th- oh my cousin's going to help me set up a uh, a Shopify site and uh, start selling cookies, and I'm like, no. <laughs> um, please let me I've been, I've been an indie hack I was already doing indie hacker stuff for a couple of years before that like please let me help you set up your site or set up your your company yeah um, so yeah that was uh yeah ended up being me and my sister um it's really worked out I mean I just talked to to Scott Keys from Scotch Cheap Flights and his business has been pretty threatened by COVID because he's in the travel industry helping people save money on flights yeah and you're in the food industry. I think most food businesses are also suffering. Most restaurants have been closed down. Uh, but you, on the other hand, are thriving. You've been blowing up. You've been posting these milestones on Indie Hackers about how you're making $100,000 in revenue uh, every month and how COVID has been like almost the best thing that could have happened to Crave Cookie because you're in the delivery business. Is that just pure luck? Or is that like, you know, you change um, your business model because of COVID? No, it was a. Uh... It was a, uh, we were already up and to the right um, as far as growth every month, every quarter. But that just gave us probably what, it was probably a 15% bump in what our normal trajectory was. Very cool. And so, yeah, we were already hitting like the the 100K a month or whatever before that. And then, yeah, after that, we just like, what was that, like in April or May? Yeah, I think your last one was 110K a month. And no, but we hit, I think it was in April or something. We hit over 200 K. Jeez. I think it was, it was in, it was in May. How many cookies is that? So we, uh, we do probably 15,000 cookies a week. And that's just to your local area. You're kind of around Sacramento. Yeah, it's one kitchen with drivers going around and delivering these cookies. Yeah. Um, That's nuts. And. See, the thing is, though, it's if part of that is, I'd say 80 to 90% of it is just from our online orders. But we have ours also partnered with like a local coffee shop that has like five locations. And so, but that's still part of a normal business model. We, we bake the cookies and we deliver them to the coffee shop. And then people come and pick up the warm cookies there. They know to do it at a certain time. And so there's a line of mm-hmm. cars lined up at this coffee drive through to pick up these cookies. Um, but yeah, it's, it's no... Uh, it doesn't add any complexity to us. It's the same business model, just delivering cookies that are freight straight from the oven. And what's your, you know, your what are your margins like? What are your expenses like selling hundreds of yeah. thousands of cookies? <laughs> Our margins are much higher than the, the typical restaurant industry. So like uh, normally margins for a, a, a restaurant is is under 15%. Um, ours are um, 35 to 40%. Nice. So yeah, so, uh, yeah it's a... It's been really, really good on that yeah. side. I think most technologists, like you're a software engineer, right? Yeah. And you also do design because your website's yes. beautiful. So you're like yeah, this sort thanks. of full stack yeah, engineer, unicorn. Uh, you've started indie hacker businesses before. I think most people in that position would never really dream of doing something uh, in the real world because the margins are low and because you can't really move atoms as fast as you can move bits and there's all sorts of pains to deal with and things in the real world that just seem, you know, antiquated and unattractive if you're a developer. Uh, wh- why why did you decide to do this? You know, why did you get excited when your sister said she was going to make a cookie business and, and not say, "You know what? That's for the birds. I'm going to I'm going to stick with this digital stuff." Yeah, I'm a I I don't know if it's something cuz I grew up in sports or whatever, but like I just get super enthusiastic about stuff really easily. So like it's no matter what, what company I'm at or whatever, if, if someone's coming to me with an idea and they're pumped about it, I just, I turn into a mirror and I just like, I'm like, yeah, this could be sick. We're going to do this. We're going to add this thing to the database and we're going to start doing all this, all this stuff. And so when she's talking about like 
her selling cookies, like I don't even think about the normal model of people doing Shopify sites or I don't even think about that stuff. I'm just thinking about like, I don't know, from a, from a software engineering point of view, like how efficient can like, when I was a growth engineer too, it wasn't just like a, I, I do all the full stack, but like for like most of my software engineering career so far, I've been a growth engineer. So that was a, a few uh, tech companies doing that. Um, the, the, yeah, big, big ones, but like, uh, the, uh, and so I, I love the marketing and growth and that side of things. And so actually building up her cookie forms and trying to optimize how people are like putting in their information, you know, the way that you make it so people are choosing the flavors right away before they even have to put in any information. And then mm. finally they put in their address and it, it does all that stuff. So like trying to optimize that and just even adding things like like how Amazon has my orders, you know, you can go back and see your order history, adding that it's built into the product and like seeing how many people, how many thousands of emails we collect uh, after people, we launched that three weeks and we have like over 10,000 emails locally. This is in a local little place that we have that many emails. It's Crazy. Like, um, yes. Yeah, so it's extremely focused on how good those uh, emails we have are, you know, so it's um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's just a, uh, I get super enthusiastic about this kind of stuff. Um, and I don't really care what the, the product is. Um, I just love doing this new, new things. Um, and, but yeah, I, I do still want to do the, the B2B side, like even doing the cookie thing. Like I still have a bunch of friends who are in sales and all that stuff. And it's just, I'm always talking about ideas. Um, there's just something about, um, how big the, the tech side can be. Mm -hmm. Um, you have faster growth or faster potential or bigger potential. Um, but, um, yeah, you, you do have a lot slower growth on the consumer side. I feel like, especially with a physical product, like we're limited by how much we can do in a store. So I've been super efficient with one store, but we have to add more, more hubs. Yeah. Um, so, but once we start doing that, it's just, it'll just snowball. I mean, the numbers are still pretty crazy. If you think about the typical internet business, you have access to, you know, theoretically, everybody on earth, everybody who's connected to the web. And uh, you see companies spending months, years trying to, to grow their email list and find customers and they don't get to 10,000. And you have a business where you're pretty much limited to your local area and you've managed to get 10,000 people on an email list. And so they were limited to a 10 mile radius. That's our delivery radius. And that's it. <laughs> and it, it's maybe, you know, is there something about that focus that helps you build a better product or deliver more happiness or convert more, more signups? Like why is it you've been able to get to such high numbers, even though you have such, you know, a relatively small uh, pool that you can play in? Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's, it. it's the focus. Um, it's the, uh, so this is the thing, just, I always loved building my own stuff. And so like with the, with the effort it takes to build things, you're actually kind of constrained in how much, um, how many features you can add in, in, a, in an amount of time and all that stuff. So like, really, we added the the online form and then it just goes into this back system thing. And then we, we kind of just keep focusing on the efficiency. And so as we just get a high volume of cookies, they're still always straight from the oven. And like, that's the kind of stuff where a lot of customers complain about certain things like, oh, I can't mix and match the flavors in a box. I have to buy two boxes if I want two flavors, but that's part of our focus. It's we see in our system how many cookies we have to make for a 30 minute time slot. We have to get this many chocolate chip and this many churro cookies or this many sugar cookies. And we know that that's that's each box is whatever. So we just kind of make all the boxes and then we start grouping those for the drivers. So it's like, yeah, we. We're extremely focused and limited um, in what we'll do. And so that means that you can just guarantee quality at that point. And so people are just constantly ordering these cookies. Um, our, um, what's it called? Our recurring customers, um, it's, it's really high. Um, you know, it's 60% of people buy again. And so it's like, uh, they're just always quality cookies when people and there are people are so surprised when they're like straight up warm when they're pulling them out of the box yeah. so like we just made them so it's like yeah 
I've never ordered cookie delivery, but I think I would also be surprised if I order and the cookies come and they're super warm because that means you've got your shit together. <laughs> You're really thinking yeah, about the customer it's, experience. It's, it's definitely one of those things where if you were to make cookies at home and you have them straight from the oven and they're still kind of falling apart, you can't pick them up yet. Um, we're almost at that that level, but they're still they're really they're really fresh and you can totally tell that we just made them. Um, but yeah, there's other cookie companies like this. Um, in different parts of the country, we were the first ones to do it in California. And so, I, yeah, like in the Mountain West, there's a lot in like Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and that kind of area. Um, but as they're growing, they're doing a lot of with franchising and and all that. And, and we're finding that a lot of their quality is going down really fast. And, and as they're kind of really branching out and not really. Uh... So, they, yeah, they're, they're growing too fast, a lot of these places. Um, so, yeah, we're just extremely focused on the. Uh, the quality, it, 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 we only have one location right now, so it's, it's a lot easier to do that. Um, but that's part of the challenge. It's, that's the fun part, scaling that. Yeah. So the goal, I think, for most indie hackers that I talk to is usually some form of freedom, right? They don't like working a normal job because you get a monetary ceiling with how much you can make with your salary. Uh, you have to work on this sort of fixed nine to five schedule. You can't control the time that you work or... Uh, all sorts of other things, you know, when you have your own business, you can control all of that. You can work from wherever you want. You can work with wh whoever you want, your sister, your friends. Uh, you can be as creative as you want. Does any of this stuff align with why you are building and growing Crave Cookie? What are your goals? Yeah, I think I started doing all the Indie Hacker stuff because I had all those same goals. Um, but I think what, what it was is I was just kind of uninterested in the companies or the um just the dynamic of the way that i was assigned work at some of these companies it's yeah it is a, it is a freedom but like this is one of the things i really like about like the netflix culture doc and it's part of their big culture thing is they have a um they, they call it like their freedom and responsibility is a big part of their their culture and i really like the uh just the enthusiasm and freedom of doing something. So I don't care if I'm working for someone, if I get the, the, that freedom and that recognition of what you're doing is actually having an impact. Yeah. Um, you probably even have more opportunities in a big company to, to do a lot of things because you don't have to focus on every single little thing you do as a founder. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I do like the freedom, but it, it's, it's also, because I love the enthusiasm, enthusiasm is contagious. I do feel a little lonely <laughs> when uh, when you're a founder and you're not like just talking to your colleagues and you, you're, yeah. you're not a founder. You're just you're just you're just bouncing ideas off people and there's no politics uh, involved with that. Being a founder is an essentially kind of lonely job because even if you have employees, their concerns, like you said, are much more focused. They're not worried about the entire business. They're not wearing every hat. And there isn't really anyone, I guess, besides other founders or perhaps your co-founder or investors who can really, you know, empathize with exactly what you're going through at any point in time, who are really like, you know, your true colleagues. Who's running, yes. who's running Crave besides just you? Is, is your sister helping? Yeah, so it's me, my sister, who's running all the, the cookie R&D and like the, the kitchen efficiency. And then uh, my brother-in-law, he's kind of, he's running the operations side. What a um, phrase, cookie R&D. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh. Yeah, but I think that uh, there's something about being on a team with other engineers and other designers who have your same skill set and being able to talk to them. When I talk to my sister about engineering, she has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so it's, I could talk about the business, but you can't talk about like the user experience that people have. Like, the yeah. different features I want to add. She's like, that sounds cool. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll <laughs> add that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's... I've seen you posting on Indie Hackers about kind of the tech side of Crave Cookie, talking about how you've kept things simple, your server costs, et cetera. And like, that seems almost like it's your escape where you can talk to some other developers who actually care and know what you're talking about and aren't just going to be like, okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I like that's one thing I like about like indie hackers and hacker news or whatever. It's like you'll know, you'll see people with comments, and then I say, actually, I, I use this technology. Like there was a, just a post on uh, Hacker News recently about like Crystal, which is a new programming language, and I'm actually all in on Crystal on 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 Crave. Like that's our server language, 
Um, and it's not even a 1.0 yet. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a bad choice from a business perspective, but like, I don't care. Um, well, this is the freedom but, uh, you get as a founder. You can do whatever yeah. you want. No one's going to say, and don't do that. It's a bad choice. If it's fun for you, you just do it. Yeah. Um, but being able to like, Yeah, it's just because I feel like I'm I'm actually onto something when, when I'm doing everything is extremely simple, um, but not going all in on the no code side. Because mm. um, there's a way, like a lot of people do how to do that with like Rails or whatever. But I'm not even using a framework for the website. Like I'm just straight up. Um, I guess I guess uh, that would anyway. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I everything is on one server in production and there's a SQLite database, meaning it's not a separate database, it's not a separate server. It's literally a file in that same database. Yeah. Um, when I started it, I was just writing to a JSON file, the whole database, that was it. And I was reading and writing from that file. And as we started to get too many orders, it's too slow to read and write. So I just moved it to SQLite and I've never changed it. Uh, I had to do things like change the way I do my database indexing to speed up my, my queries and all that. But, uh, yeah, it's just getting super optimized and, and it's it's cheap. Like we uh you know, we're paying less than three hundred dollars a month for the server stuff and that includes like the deployment and all that. I have another server for deploying and building all this stuff, but um So what kind of stuff are you building? Like if I if I am a customer experiencing Crave Cookie or I'm an employee of Crave Cookie, what are the sort of digital properties that all this code is is running? Yeah, so um most of the code or most of the app is on the admin side. So that's very similar to how in Shopify, when you log in, it's shopify.com slash admin. And that's your, that's your, as the store, that's your side of the, the app. Um, and so from there, when people purchase cookies, it feeds into our orders um, and we can basically view all the orders. There's a lot of filters and things for viewing orders, view it by time slot, by customer, by whatever. And in the, in the orders, when we're, we're, we get all these orders by time slot, we have to like group those because we have to, we open up maps in the app. It, it'll open up maps for each time slot, for each 30 minute time slot. And you can see the clusters of where all these orders are. Um, so we have people who are literally clustering these orders on the map in the app, um, like grouping them. And then when a driver is available, we start giving them these groups of clusters. Like here, you got these five orders. And then the next hour, you got these other five orders. Here's all these, here's 10 orders of cookies, go. Um, and so the, yeah, the software, that's one of the, the benefits of me being a software engineer. Like this, this cookie business um, wouldn't have all these little tools, um, this little competitive advantages of a local delivery business without me kind of customizing all like, like I'm using Google Maps, all, all their APIs and with the built into our admin dashboard. Um, and yeah, just um, there's other things as far as like, uh, you know, flavor management, um, calendars, all that stuff for when flavors are available or, or delivery hours, how many deliveries per slot. You know, if we have a driver calls in sick, we have one list driver for that few time slots. Um, yeah, it sounds, uh, sounds pretty <laughs> complex. I mean, if yeah, I go to no- order from a website, like a typical website, Half the time, I'm not even sure they're going to get my online order. Like their website looks like it was made in Microsoft Paint. I'm like, is this even going to work? Uh, meanwhile, you've got like a very modern <laughs> tech, you know, business going with this sort of cookie front where it's super optimized. You put a lot of work into to actually building out all this stuff. How much of an advantage yeah. does that really give you? You know, does that help you save a ton of money? Does that help you make your business much more efficient? Yeah, there, there's features that before I added them, like before I added the maps that were built in, you literally had the address that was a link. You would click on that order's address and it would open Google Maps in a separate window with that icon. Mm-hmm. And when we have in one time slot, 60 to 70 orders in 30 minutes, you can't go through and see where each of these are. You're trying to guess by looking at the street name where a driver, like which orders go to which driver. And I wasn't grouping them either. Like you were just assigning them individually to a driver. And it was a lot of time. Um, when there's 60 or 70 of them and you have one person assigning orders, that's, you have to do one a minute. That's insane. You, you literally don't have anything else. You can't use, take a bathroom break. Um, and so um, 
it's it's more like the technology has enabled us to have a higher ceiling of how many orders we could actually fulfill um, based on how efficient the uh, the assigning and, and grouping and making sure the driver has the maximum amount of, of orders in his car when he's leaving. Right. Um, otherwise, yeah, you're, you're giving him and then you realize that two drivers are in the same area. Then one has to drive across town after that. It's just really bad. And so, yeah, there's, there's even more like, now that we're doing all this with grouping, like I could start adding software to just just start clustering these groups automatically. I don't need someone to assign them. You know, that's it's more ideas I have. And as I keep doing that, the, the software is more valuable. The business is more valuable because we're actually innovating. And there's, there's a lot of restaurants that would probably want to use this stuff. You know, like, Yeah, you can uh, strip this out and basically sell it yeah. like white label to any other, you know, restaurant that's doing its own delivery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's something yeah. so fun about uh, building internal tools because your sister, she's doing cookie R&D. Her customers are really the people who are eating the cookies, right? She needs to make delicious cookies, make sure their process is repeatable. Your customers as, uh, you know, sort of a CTO, technical co-founder are to your, really your employees, making sure, like you said, your delivery drivers can take a bathroom break, making their job as easy and efficient and painless as possible. And when you're developing code and tools for your own employees, it's just wonderful because you get such good feedback. Like these are people you see all the time. You can talk to them. They're not, you know, it's people you have to hunt down and try to figure out how you're going to talk to your customers. They're right there working for you all the time. And it just, I think it creates such a positive feedback loop where it's much easier to make sure you're building the right thing. Yeah. That's one thing I, that's the reason why I don't always like remote work is there are some of these feedback loops, especially early in a company when you're building internal tools and you, you need to see the people using them. Mm. So I, I'd have to visit the warehouse a few times and actually just sit there and watch them or just talk to them about it. Um, Cause they don't always like a lot of these people are, they're young. Like our, one of our manager where our manager of the warehouse um, is a girl in her twenties. Um, and like, she, I, I don't know if she feels intimidated to, to always give me all these little feedbacks about, Hey, this thing's broken. There's a bug here. Um, like it's just, um, yeah, so like actually being inv- more involved with that, with the, the, the customer tooling or the employee tooling. Um, but yeah, it's not just the employee side since I, I do run the, the form that when people check out and like their mm. confirmation and their orders page and their billing history and, and all that stuff. So it's like doing both. One engineer, it's a lot of work. Yeah, so it's just you writing all this code, doing all this design. Let's yeah, talk about... Goodness. Yeah, thank yeah. goodness there's all these... Uh, Third-party tools that like with like I use like Stripe and Google Maps and Twilio. I'm like man, that this would be impossible with all that stuff. I think it's easier than ever, you know, or maybe not easier, but it's more it's more empowering than it's ever been to be kind of a solo developer starting an online business because you can do all this crazy stuff by yourself, and it's not easy. I mean, you still have, probably have to work a ton. You still have to be good at what you do. You probably developed a lot of skills over the years, but it's possible. You actually can do it, and that means that. You can basically scale up an operation like this with as few costs as possible. You don't need a giant team of developers. You can just do one thing and have a ton of profit. And also, I think you just get the increased efficiency that comes from having a small team where you don't have a ton of communication overhead. right? You don't have a bunch of other developers or managers or people you have to communicate your product plans to and take you know six months to develop a feature. You can just think of something and build it today because you're just a team of one. Yeah. But that also means I get excited about a feature and it's not really the, the most important thing, but yeah, I don't care. And I'm gonna, <laughs> I love seeing this thing out. And actually most people, yeah, I get this hunch to build something and it's not like as important as something else. But uh, people are excited when they see it, especially like my sister or whatever. Um, so that's just being exposed to product development um, and product managers. Um, they always have these features they want you to build. But now I actually get to go off my hunch um, and and build what I feel like is um, distinguishing. Like just little things like when there's only one or two orders left in a time slot, like just actually showing that in that time slot on the form, like that kind of stuff. Like I just, it's not as much of a priority as um, online shipping, like actually us shipping cookies in, in the mail. Because um, we probably make a lot of money from that. But um, I want to really optimize our current business model um, before I start adding all these other things. Cause I, cause you, that, that likelihood of me going back and optimizing these things when I have two things on my plate is, is a lot lower. 
I've got a kind of a recency bias, recency bias rule for myself and indie hackers where I'll always get excited about some new thing that I've thought of or someone suggested that I really want to build. And usually whatever I've recently thought of just becomes by far the most exciting thing in my mind. And anything else kind of gets pushed to the back. And pretty consistently it's been the case where if I am excited about building something, that excitement outweighs like my rational decision-making process. And I haven't really thought through it. So my rule for myself now is basically I have to be still excited about something a month after I first thought about it for me to actually build it. I'm not allowed to just build anything that it just comes to mind. Otherwise, I'm going to waste a ton of time. But uh, it is super fun to just indulge and do whatever you want and and just you know use the programming language that you want, build the features that you're excited about, and realize that like it's probably not going to kill your business and you're having a lot of fun doing what you want to do. Yeah, everything does go in my backlog and I do order it. So there's at least some um, accountability there. But yeah, I... Uh... I, I do feel like that if you're excited about something, it'll show when you build it. Um, and you, you uh, if I'm excited, and I'm, I'm feeling it, I'm in the zone, I'll put a little extra touch on my form validations, all these different things of how the, the form is processing. You know, if you're, if it's just a pain to you, you'll forget to put the little loading icon when someone clicks on a form. They're like, is it submitting? I don't know. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, so I do, you do need to be excited about what you're working on because then what's the point? If you're a founder, like that's, you need to be excited about it. So let's talk about how you got here because you weren't always running a cookie business and your previous anti hacker businesses, uh, or at least your last project was a SaaS business. It was all online. Uh, tell me about that. What were you working on? How'd you come up with the idea? Yeah, my last thing was called Gamify. Um, and that was a tool that was basically for gamification. And you make these achievement lists that people can embed inside of their app. And so, for example, when someone signs up for, I had this idea when I was working at Qualtrics, which is like the big survey, the enterprise survey company. Um, so like, uh, they're part of SAP now, but like, uh, yeah, so when someone signs up, um, there's so many things to do. Um, imagine going into like Photoshop for the first time, you never used Photoshop before, how many things you can do. You kind of want a list of things, hey, um, just draw a square for, for the first right. time. And then like, and then once you do it, um, checking off that item of the list automatically, it's part of, it's built into the thing. So like, um, yeah, with that achievement list idea, there was a lot with, as far as like detecting stuff in, in the, in the browser, like doing all this, this Dom diffing and all that stuff. Like when someone clicks an element, how do I detect that element is what they want it to be done or yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of complexity there. Um, and I just, I still think that kind of stuff works. People like, people don't want like guides and walkthroughs where it kind of forces you around the app. I don't like that stuff because people usually just click X on that. But like, if it's a little list that kind of gives you some tasks that you can kind of check off, mm. um, I feel like that helps with me. So I, I don't know what, what the market says, but. Uh, so the idea would be that with, you know, if I were to use this as a customer, let's say I use this for ND hackers. You know, I would install it on my website and there'd be a little list in the bottom right or something that says, you know, here are five things you can do, like fill out your profile, create a product, add an avatar, make a post. And as they do those things, it's kind of checking off the list and they feel like they're getting better at using. Yeah, and it's even more advanced than that because it has had built in APIs and stuff. So like you can say, get five upvotes and you can actually, as indie hackers, kind of figure out how to detect someone has five upvotes and then talk to my API and tell them that they have five upvotes. Mm. And then they'll see that in their list. Um, and so you can kind of gamify it even more. It's kind of like what a badge systems you would see like on Reddit or whatever. Like, right. Um, but kind of letting other companies have it built in and it's a separate platform. So why, why did you stop working on this? Like what was kind of the arc of the story? Yeah, so like I, with B2B, it's super important that you have a people person on, on the other side. So I did, I had a guy who's a, he's a VP of sales at a, another tech company. Uh, I still talk to him all the time. Um, we're, we're still talking about ideas, but like, uh, um, it's more like I was completely in on the code and building and the design, but then he was still in the, let's test, let's see if this is, viable even though i already built everything so he's kind of just like floating ideas or he's kind of just kind of talk to some people in the discovery phase mm -hmm. 
And so I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Um, I, by a lot, I spent too much time on this thing. Um, how much time? Uh, probably eight months. Eight months just coding it. Yeah. Wow. Before you had it's, any sales. It wasn't a, it wasn't a full-time job, but like, um, eight months of, you know, time. So like probably if it was a full-time job, probably would have been two or three months. Mm. Um, so, um, yes. And so he was kind of floating. He was talking to people on LinkedIn. He was, uh, he had a good email list. He was just talking to, you know, people with product managers and all this stuff. And it's just, it's really hard to, um, just do that grind. And I, I don't think he was as invested enough yet because it was still early and he wasn't as excited about it. So it's like, well, what more can I really do? <laughs> like, um, so it was just finding the, the product market fit and getting a customer base. Like, I do think that it's still something that's super valuable to people, but, uh, um, every time I show the actual product to people, they're like, well, that's pretty cool. Um, um, but, uh, did you make any sales? Did you make any generate any revenue with this thing? No. Never got to the point where you sold anything. And what was it like deciding? No. I to- didn't even have a a payment form or anything up. It was still in the in the beta stage. You're still building it. Yeah. So what was it like deciding to to quit that? You know, what was that decision uh, like? Um. Yeah, that was actually. It was not me deciding to quit it. It was more like. Oh, look at that over there. <laughs> um, so is, uh, but yeah, like I'm, like I was saying, I, I just get super excited about other ideas. Um, so if something is not successful, um, naturally I'll, I'll just find something else. It's other shiny get, things I, will take its place. Yeah, I don't get super bummed about it. I am a, I am a growth engineer. I am a data analyst. I, I, I just see the logical side of things too. It's not. I'm just all emotion and excitement so i will just be like yeah uh, screw that little thing i'm just over it so Um, i assume the the shiny thing that you know distracted you was your sister saying she wants to launch a cookie company um what was yes that was that was around the same time yeah um i started that when i still lived in seattle yeah so that was that was a not long after that. That was in tw- 2018, late 2018, yeah. And you're thinking, okay, I'm a growth engineer. My sister wants to do this on Shopify. I can make this so much better, so much cooler. Uh, where did you start with Crave Cookie? What's the first thing that you do? Yeah, so we did look at all the stuff with Shopify. We looked at all this and how expensive it is. Um, just for an MVP, I don't want to have a commitment of like how much I have to pay a month, like. $60 a month or whatever it is, plus a bigger cut of your sales. And then, um, so like, oh, I can easily build a website. I can easily build a form that feeds into a JSON file. Um, and we just handle payments through Stripe or whatever. And then when you go to the admin side, you just see all the orders. Um, and it's, it's pretty simple. And when, once an order is marked delivered, it filters that one out. You don't see it anymore. That was the MVP, and it's extremely easy. You just loop through all the orders in in the file, and I just render a table in the admin side. It's it's, yeah. How long until you made your first cookie sales? Because if you're building this from scratch, I imagine it's going to take. Yeah, it took me one to two weeks to build this thing, and we had our first sale. Um, Very cool. And it was growing fast in that little small town that my sister was living in. So she's she moved since then to a bigger city. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, we were in a little small town, Ripon, California, a little tiny town. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just started to really grow. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, we're going to move to a bigger town and, you know, put in some roots, get this thing growing. So with an online business, you know, the way people find their first customers is, you know, creating an email list or tweeting or posting on something like Product Hunt or Hacker News or cold emailing people. How did you make your first sales in just one to two weeks in the real world selling cookies to people in your sister's town? Um, Instagram and Facebook groups. Um, this was in 2018. Um, so, yeah, we she just started contacting people she knew um, on, on uh, Instagram and Facebook. 
they're just announcing that uh, there's these warm cookies available. So like, yeah, I think I think people kind of like the idea of buying buying some homemade cookies, but it definitely looked different than just oh this this girl I know is selling cookies because once you go to the website, it definitely doesn't feel like a some local person selling cookies. Um, and that that's that was my side. I'm trying to make it feel like a um, a reputable company. <laughs> instead of a uh, someone selling cookies from their kitchen in my mom's house because <laughs> <laughs> yes he was they were yeah they were in between houses they were moving from Sacramento lived in my mom for a while until they were moving down to Fresno Clovis and so they uh yeah from my mom's kitchen with a cottage food license where you're allowed to sell up to 40 grand of product a year um, without much regulation um they, uh, yeah, that she just started selling them there. So give me like a, a snapshot of like all the rules and regulations that go into this. Cause I have no idea how to start a food company. You've got to get a yeah. license. I assume you have to do something to make sure, you know, your, your kitchen is up to quality, up to snuff. If you're going to start one of these things and you're, and you're an indie hacker wanting to do an MVP, um, you just have to get what's called a cottage food license. It might be different in different States. But in California, you just need a cottage food license. And that means, like I was saying, you can sell up to 40 grand a year and it's much less regulated. You can be in your home kitchen. Um, you can, you don't have to have all the nutrition facts. You can just put allergens. Um, there's the way that you package things. It's different. There's, there's, there's rules about you can't have any pets in the kitchen. You have to have your, your gate zip around the kitchen and stuff. But um. Yeah, so for people wanting to get something started, if you just want to just try selling food locally, um, yeah, it, it's just sounds very super simple. simple regulations. It's 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 like people who go to a uh, uh, what's it called? It's like a bake a, sale or a a bake sale or like a, when, when they have like the farmer produce we can go a farmers go market. Like, yeah, farmers market. Um, people have all these little things they can sell at farm, farmers markets. They have rice krispie treats they made or whatever. Um, and a lot of those people, I, I'm sure, don't have any kind of license unless the farmers market requires you to have it. So that so they probably do. But uh, yeah, it's a very simple license to be able to sell stuff like that. But with our volume, we quickly needed a real license. <laughs> um, so that that's when it starts to get really expensive because you have to actually relatively expensive um we're not we don't have a huge storefront with all the seating and like the the nice bathrooms or whatever so like it's different so we, we just have a warehouse you don't see but it's still there's there's still regulation you have to have with it the way that the kitchen is set up the way the ceiling has to be over the kitchen where you store your ingredients how you store your ingredients um the dress code for people making these things you know the hair nets and all that and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn. Um, none of us had any experience. My sister's been making cookies for a long time, but she's never done it commercially. So it was a lot of experience and, and, uh, and growth hacking, um, kind of doing things and then asking questions later. Yeah. Um, setting up a kitchen and then, and then getting a license for the bigger warehouse after it's already running, you know, doing stuff like that. And, once you start working, it's not so like, oh, the police are going to come and shut you down. Um, you're working with the county to get these things set up. And they know you're working with them. They're going to give you some slack if they know you're um, you're trying to be legitimate and they, you, you're running it. You're trying to start a business. Um, so it's that was good. And especially since we were working with a coffee shop and, and they had some experience doing that. So. It, you really need friends who who have any kind of experience in it, and you'll you'll find that if you're doing sales and you're working with people. Was there an inflection point where you went from, you know, this is just an MVP? It's me and my sister. We'll see how this goes. Sell a few cookies online to, oh shit, we need to hire people. We need to expand our operations. This is a real business. I'm going to put a lot of time and effort into this. Yeah. So for me, it's different than for my sister. I always saw this as passive income. Um. I was fine working in the tech companies I was working in. Um, and 
like even before the quarant like even before quarantine and all the COVID stuff, like I was supposed to go into Google and go work at Google and stuff while I was doing this on the side. But like that happened and things changed. <laughs> um and the uh yeah, so I was always kind of seeing this as passive income and I would I would just kind of keep optimizing the engineering side. Um and put in nights and weekends. Um but yeah, after the quarantine happened and we got such a huge bump and I could actually see how much growth we could get, how this is a seven figure business out of one delivery hub, having a food business make seven figures is crazy. That's a, a restaurant. That's like Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger do that, but not everyone can own a prime location Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger, you know? So um, to get a a restaurant that can make seven figures and have almost 40% margins is it's a rare opportunity. So to, to now after the quarantine's going and we actually have some, some capital to work with mm-hmm. um, or yeah, after the quarantine happened in like, that was like March. Um, we saw the, 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 all the potential um, and we actually had some, some money in the bank to work with on track for seven figures. Yeah. We got to get a second location. So that that's when we, that's when things start to get real. Now that we we're, we're locking down the second location, we have it for, we're going to get the second delivery hub. And, uh, that's, there's going to be a lot of things now that have to change with the software as far as having multi-hub support, especially when you're ordering, which delivery hub are you in? Um, are there differences in how many slots are available because there's different number of drivers per different delivery hub. But these are the kind of problems that once I solve them, um, the company can, just copy and paste, you know, I can copy and paste more delivery hubs at that point. And we, once you do the first second, once you do the first new hub, the third and fourth and fifth are going to be so much easier. Right. Um, and once we have like 10 locations, you know, is this something I can franchise? Is this something that I can, is a software that I can finally sell to other people? Cause we're managing 10 locations. Um, so like you're kind of like constructing and perfecting, the playbook right now. And then after that, the goal is just to run the playbook in as many locations as you possibly can. Yeah. So like that's part of my philosophy is always keep things as simple as possible, but optimize it. Um, you want to stand out because there's other cookie companies and there's even ones that are starting in California. They're moving over now. They're expanding. And so we can beat them with, just better cookies, always warm, and they deliver them fast. And it's, yeah, that's part of it too. It's like when people get deliveries, all of our drivers are wearing our Crave gear and it's just part of the experience. You know, you're getting a Crave driver. The whole thing is just our brand. And we've even had things where, because people can write write messages on the box. That's part of when you order. And so there's people like, they'll write notes and say, tell the driver to, to spin before he hands me the box, just little weird things. And then he'll do it. And they, they <laughs> post it on our Instagram. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of stuff where we're kind of building a brand that's, that's more holistic. It's not just a cookie delivery service. Um, there it's, it's very popular in the town that we're in. Um, and the, the amount of people posting about it, like them opening the box or them excited when they open the door and it's our delivery driver. Um, there is a definite local brand there. Um, and that's, that's why it's one of the, I guess the benefits of us having gone completely do it ourselves, don't hire any external services. Yeah. Maybe it would have been good to, to use DoorDash or whatever when we were getting started for the MVP, but my brother-in-law was just driving. We didn't need to pay DoorDash. (laughs) And so we kind of just naturally went from my brother-in-law driving to hiring a driver instead of scaling up the the third party um, service. Yeah, that strikes me as a pretty crucial part of how your business works because most restaurants that do delivery, I mean, you're always faced with this choice. Do we do delivery ourselves? Do we hire our own drivers? Or do we use one of these services like DoorDash, Postmates, Grubhub, Uber Eats? And it's not just delivery, like all these services provide discovery too. A lot of people will figure out what they're going to eat because they go onto these platforms and see a list of restaurants. But since you're not using them, you're not there. You have to somehow get people to know about Crave Cookie and want to order you without you being a part of all these delivery services. 
Uh, what's been your sort of strategy for growth? You know, how have you been able to reach so many tens of thousands of people? It's been completely organic. It's uh, it's people posting about us. And that's the benefit of us being a hyper local company. When people post, it's their friends and neighbors seeing it. And so, and those are who are other customers or potential, potential customers. Um, and so once people are kind of raving about a local cookie delivery thing, it's, it just spreads really fast. And so there were some things that injected the growth, like getting featured on some prominent local people's feed. It's not like we paid them or anything. It just, it was organic, but then like a news company, like a local Fox station or something wanting us to be on their new, their morning news for local cookie delivery for national chocolate chip day or something. Um, we gave free cookies to like policemen and firefighters or I don't know what yeah. it was. Uh, um, yeah. So it was that kind of stuff that, uh, that got us to be more discovered at first, but then now it's just mostly people posting about it all the time. And then that gets other people to see it and, and like, Oh yeah, I'm going to buy some cookies right now. <laughs> Um, and then yeah, we just, we'll, we'll post things on Instagram or, uh, um, but yeah, we haven't needed to do any email, email marketing at all. No text message marketing at all, even though every order has a phone number and usually a customer, uh, email, we haven't used those ever to, uh, send marketing stuff. So yeah, it's, we just been having hyper organic growth. Um, and yeah, it's it's completely based off of the social media. <laughs> it's one it. of the one of the uh, the best things you can do as an indie hacker when you're trying to get your first foothold and grow your business is you want to pick a really small niche. You know, there's so many big companies that are targeting the mainstream, and if you can find you know some small group of people who are all you know who share products via word of mouth with each other and who all are pretty similar and who are underserved by some bigger market, then you can like get a foothold. And I think what you've done that's super cool is like your niche has just been your local community. And as you said, everybody in your local community, they all know each other. Um, if somebody orders a box of cookies, it's kind of a naturally viral product. Like you don't order a box of cookies and eat it all yourself, unless you're me. <laughs> uh, you're probably sharing it with other people and they're going to you know, want to know where you got them, et cetera. And you're going to talk to other people about them if it's a good experience. And so it seems like such a great way to like just start growing your business and you kind of escape the competition that way. There's not a bunch of other giant cookie companies competing with you and it's kind of easier to get on the local news than it is to get you know, on some sort of massive news website online or be the top of product hunt. Uh, everything is scaled down. There's just there's just much less competition and you can just really shine and then grow from there. So I think it's pretty cool to see the way that you've actually executed on this. Yeah, and having the big tech experience, I see how cutthroat the big tech world is and how optimized a lot of that stuff is for marketing and all that stuff. And taking that down to the local pond, um, it's it's much easier Right. Um, and th from that side, there's things that are harder, but, uh, oh, also from the, oh, sorry to go back from the growth thing. We did also have early on gift messages that we handwrite on every box. So you can, when you're checking out, put in, I, 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 it's less than 150 characters or something, but we will write it on the box. Um, and so we get a lot of gift orders. Um, so people are gifting them to other people. It's a very, creative gift it's a box of cookies from a local cookie delivery company that are huge and warm so it's like and it's a handwritten message from that person so it's a lot of gifts and that gets people to discover it super smart there's nothing more viral than a product that you can gift you know like a hallmark yeah. card you never buy a hallmark card and just keep it you give it to somebody and then now they know about hallmark cards and they'll want to give it to somebody else and so it's kind of built into your product to be viral and if you're you know, selling cookies as gift boxes, that's such a great natural way for the product to basically uh, be something that others discover. And it's not something yeah. like with online products, a lot of people will put a feature in there where they'll just say, oh, you know, uh, share this with a friend. Here's a share button, you know, and it's like, well, the product isn't naturally something that you want to give away. So why would anyone use that? But with something like cookies, it kind of is, you know, it's a great gift for uh, a birthday or Valentine's Day or any, any sort of thing like that. And so, you know, if you just like nudge people to do it, you're not trying to convince them to engage in some totally foreign behavior that they wouldn't do normally. You're just, you know, sort of going with the flow and sort of a judo move. Like, hey, people want to share cookies. Let's just make it easier and make that experience better. Yeah, we literally just broke our, our single day delivery record um, 
on Father's Day, the Saturday before Father's Day. Oh yeah. Um, and so that just, yeah, it's, it's all about the gifting. Um, it's not all gifting, but yeah, it's, uh, even if you're like me, I'm kind of a health nut where I, I, uh, I don't like eating a lot of, uh, like cookies, <laughs> cookies or just, just, just processed food in general. Not that, you know, you know, it's just, uh, when I say processed, I just mean like not whole natural ingredients. Like I like bland almost like I'll straight up just put cucumbers and and uh carrots in a bowl with some peanut sauce on it you know like that's i like the simple but like uh even me would gift these to someone because i know it's nice to gift them even if someone just has a few bites um they're still really good (laughs) um and yeah so even though i don't eat our cookies um i definitely enjoy my samples (laughs) so let's talk about the uh you know you're talking about the the sort of competitive landscape with a local business. And, you know, some things are easier. There's less competition. Your competitors are less sophisticated. You know, they haven't done marketing at a big tech company. They haven't optimized everything. And so you can kind of compete easier in the smaller pond, but there's some things that are that are harder because it's local. Uh, what's harder about a local business? Yeah, once you start doing local business, there's just more regulation. Local business is the way that business has always been done before tech disrupted it. And so there's human history of regulation, uh, or at least American law history of regulation. Um, And so there's a lot of um, hoops to jump through compared to just starting an online business. It's where it's still kind of the Wild West. You kind of do whatever you want. Um, So there's... The regulation side, there's the I would say you definitely so it's it's not just local, there's also there's B2B versus uh, B2C, because you can be local and, and serving local businesses. Um, but yeah, we're serving local consumers. And so in any consumer company, you always have to like have a strong focus on your brand and reputation. Right. And with local, that that's it's crucial to have a good reputation and, and so word of mouth spreads because we don't even have a location, so people aren't finding us on Google Maps and reading our reviews. There's no location to look up, and so we are go, we are kind of lucky that we there's not any like bad reviews. Like my cookies were too soft, they're undercooked. <laughs> like oh no, because like in the early in the first slot of the day, sometimes like when the ovens are, we, we haven't warmed them up enough. Um, you know, that, that might happen, you know, so like that, you know, people posting on Yelp or a Google map review or something like that's, that could hurt you bad if you if it drops you down a star. But you just don't but, have uh, any of those. There's no don't, Yelp don't page. We care about that stuff. We're, we're just on Instagram. People see us on Instagram. They see all, all their friends commenting. Then we have hundreds of comments on a, on a thread and someone's like, Ooh, I got to give me some of those. Yeah. And so it's more like reading reviews, um, in a in a live thread, like if you were to go read reviews on Hacker News or on Reddit or something, versus um, re- uh, looking at reviews on a static review site, that's more of like where our um, kind of it's yeah, it's more of the local where people are just kind of talking locally. Um, how to how to get involved with that stuff? So it's not like any business can do this. Um, you can't do the selling. I don't know. There's 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 a lot of stuff you would sell locally like that. Like it's just, I don't know. It's at what point does like the, the homemade factor really like help you versus hurt you? Like if you're selling suntan or suntan lotion or sunscreen or something like, can you do that homemade? Who wants to buy that? It's, it's a solved <laughs> problem or something. You can just go do that, whatever. So like, do you want to, but like chapstick might be okay. I don't know if you want to be someone who's making, like I have my own beehives and I have this, this, my home, like, my beeswax or whatever, like that might be something you can do. Or like I, my uncle owns this, well, not my uncle. I'm just saying it's an example. Um, owns a, a, a dairy farm or something like maybe I can try to do a, a, a different kind of local delivery for the milkman, you know, try yeah. to do that again. Um, so there's certain things that, that might have a certain kind of a, you know, cachet or certain vibe um, that you can do kind of this premium homemade kind of product. Um, 
Have you thought about that, expanding into something besides just cookies? Yes. <laughs> um, that's definitely um, something like I just – I want to make smoothies. <laughs> I love healthy food. Um, it's like I'm not I'm not a strict vegan. Like I was vegan for for years. But like I don't I still don't do dairy or anything. But like, um, so I do like the uh, the healthier plant based kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think just having something like these premium smoothies um, that people can get and you just deliver them and. But like that company is literally only delivering smoothies. Like we're not we're not branching into Jamba Juice where they're sell, starting to sell all these little pastries or, or pretzels or whatever. It's like we literally just deliver smoothies, and that's the kind of focus that you get. And you you start to you get a brand. People start to to associate you strongly with that product instead mm-hmm. of like a yeah. So if they see you as premium cookies, premium smoothies instead of a cookie company or a um, a smoothie company. So like. Another thing is like um, we've had a lot of change in the last what is it fifty years since the rise of fast food, and so people don't make food anymore at home or not well. A lot of the knowledge that people got from their parents, grandparents, and stuff has kind of been lost. Family recipes and all that. And so, is there a way to get back to homemade food? but still tastes better than everything else. So like you're not losing anything, you're actually gaining everything. You're, you're getting better food, tastes better, it's higher quality, it's better for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and is there a way to have a delivery service that just has, hey, this is these are our meals for the week today, or like Thursday we have lasagna or pot roast. You know, you know, Friday we have these two things. It's like, and then you have to still make it simple because you wanna make it so you can have it super efficient, um, but then you start selling, you sending out these, these foil trays to people. So like families, moms, whatever can buy actual good dinners, but it's way more convenient and better than everything else. Like there's really not a, anything like that, that I know of. Um, but it's, it's just super focused and it has a really predictable calendar that you can look at. And it has a variety because a lot of the things with variety is, uh, people think that having a, a, a big menu is variety. But I like I like change. People like change. People like changing seasons. They like it when it's cold, and then it gets hot. And when it's the middle of summer, you're missing the winter. When it's the middle of winter, you're missing the summer. You like change. And people gripe about it, like, oh, bring back your sugar cookie. But they like it when it comes back, and they buy it. Right. So variety isn't always just having a lot of features or having a lot of products. Sometimes it's just changing your products or having a... a uh, just a, a calendar or a, uh, I don't know, just a, a rotating, um, re- revolving product line. So like that's when we added flavor of the week and we had our churro cookie, which was our second flavor. And it was very popular. People love it. When we announced we were not going to have that as a staple anymore, and we we're going to do flavor of the week. People were freaking out. Um, cause it's very popular. You know, it's like three or 40% of our sales. Yeah. It's like their favorite cookie gone. Yeah. But we said, it's not gone. We'll bring it back as flavor of the week, probably once or twice a month. Um, so you'll still get it, but now you'll probably trust that mouse that is your favorite cookie. And that's exactly what happened. When we, we offered um, churro cookie once before we, it was a staple. And we had a guy who kept going on every single time he posted on Instagram, bring back the churro cookie. <laughs> bring back the churro cookie. Um, and we did, we made it a staple. He loves it. And then we got rid of it. We added flavor of the week. He tried the the sugar cookie and he said it's his favorite cookie he's ever had. And he's like, bring back the sugar cookies. <laughs> Don't make it a flavor of the week anymore. Like so people love the rotation, um, even if they complain. But like in, to te- in today's society where we have all this advanced technology and things, you can mostly get everything you want when you want it. You can get air conditioning when you want it. You can get... You can exercise when you want, not because you have to. <laughs> um, you can. Uh, there's just so many things available to you that you're not told no a lot. And so, to tell people, no, we're not going to give you that flavor, or no, we have a limited amount of deliveries. We're not going to hire more drivers. Um, 
no, we're not open past 10 p.m. or we don't open before a certain time. Like it really does create some kind of scarcity. Yeah. Um, that people like, even if they say they don't. It, that's that's part of like when you were a kid, like collecting Pokemon cards. There's the why did why were Pokemon cards so popular? Because you would just there's the scarcity, there's the randomness. It's kind of like gambling. Yeah. Like you don't I know want, what you're gonna I get want, in that pack. Yeah. So that's trying to have that kind of. Is it, this was all completely luck. Starting it like it was a constraint of me building the software from scratch, and me not wanting to add multiple flavor support. When I had to change. We had chocolate chip. When I wanted to add another flavor, we literally had to get rid of chocolate chip and the other flavor be the <laughs> be chocolate chip. But in the in the software, I was changing it to say not chocolate chip or whatever it is. Oh, if it's between these days, show this flavor instead in the software, even though it still says chocolate chip in the database. Um, so it was completely like me slowly adding multiple flavor support. Now we can add as many flavors as we want on the form, but we learned not well, scarcity to. is smart. Yeah, there's a uh, a bakery that I used to live by called Mr. Holmes Bakehouse, and they had an Instagram account where they would post, you know, here's our menu for today. And every day there'd be different flavors of donuts and different things. And there was like this one like apple bourbon donut they made that I thought was the best thing in the world. But they only had it like once a month. And if they had it every day, I think I would have just gone there every day for like a week until I got sick of apple bourbon donuts and just stopped. But because they didn't, as long as I lived there, I would check their Instagram account every day. And then like once a month, I would see that they had the apple bourbon donut and I would go down to the to the bake shop just because of that scarcity and the fact that it, it just caused me to miss that thing. You know, they don't let me sort of gorge myself and go over the limit. They kind of limit how much I can get of the thing that I want, which makes me crave it even more and it makes me a more loyal customer over time. So I think that's super smart and it's super, uh, it's in line with just what psychologically we know about marketing and selling. People like scarcity. Yeah, we sell out daily. And so we... By the, by the end of the day, like if you're at three or four o'clock, there's no time slots left and we deliver till like past nine. And so it's, yeah, there's definitely something to it as far as like limiting what people can do. Yeah. Even if we could hire a couple more drivers and get a few more slots in there, just let it sell out. It makes people have a higher opinion of your company just because they think it's more premium and everyone's buying from it. It's like there was a huge social proof marketing that was happening a couple years ago where mm-hmm. you would see all these pop-ups on a website. Who's oh, buying? so-and-so just bought a shirt. Right. So yeah, this, this just happened. It's like there's that social proof side. And just, just by having things sold out or one slot left, and we're not lying, we're not just trying to get you to buy cookies. We only have one slot left. Um, then, yeah, there's, there's, there's some social proof there. And it gets people to c- continue to associate you with a higher quality. There's a good book on this. And it's not a business book at all. It's just a psychology book. It's called Influence by Robert Cialdini. And he talks about kind of six principles of influence and kind of, you know, how people convince other people to do other things. And two of the big ones are scarcity um, and social proof. You know, we like to to do things if we know that there's a time limit. We know that, you know, there's not a lot of resources to go along, to go around. We want to make sure we get something before it's too late. And social proof, you know, we kind of take our cues from other people. We see other people like things and we trust those things more. We sort of outsource our thinking to others rather than having to figure out everything from first principles ourselves. Uh, so I recommend anyone who's trying to sell something, uh, that are, uh, you know, whether it's in the real world or online, to, to read this book because human psychology is just so important. Um, and this works you know, like in, in online communities and, and SaaS businesses as well. With Indie Hackers, for example, we'll have you know, certain conversations, uh, certain forum posts that occur pretty much irregularly. For example, we'll have like a big, hey, show off your landing page post on the forum. And we tried building this into like sort of a permanent feature. And there was always, you know, a little bit of participation. People would kind of post their landing pages every now and then. Uh, but then every now and then, if we just do like one big post, like once or twice a month, that post will get like 300 comments because everybody's been waiting for the opportunity to share their thing. And so I think it's not just cookies. It's not just food or, or real world businesses. But even if you have like a SaaS business or a community online, if you sort of limit your features and you create some scarcity, I think it'll create more demand. And it's just something I think is underused. And it's kind of cool to see how, how you're doing it with Crave. Yeah, that was always the philosophy with like a, with the, the founders of Basecamp, they always had that kind of philosophy where they, they don't give all the customers all the features they always wanted. And uh, they're still relevant today. So there's, there's still <laughs> news with their new, their hey, their hey email thing they're just launching. So they're, uh, yeah, that's, it's not the only philosophy. Um, so the ones that work, but it's, 
depends what you're selling. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Sam, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, it's been super cool to hear about Crave Cookie. Uh, your growth is insane. And it sounds like you've got a ridiculous number of ideas for where you can go in the future. Uh, what would your advice be to the other indie hackers who are listening in who haven't found any success yet, who don't know what to work on, and who are maybe you know considering starting something new? What do you think they should know? So I can only speak to really like technical people because I'm a technical person. Um, but uh, I guess it is, it's not completely true. But yeah, the uh, you're probably really good at something or really interested in something. And you don't realize how you can pair with someone in a very random way to sell something. I was a very good software engineer, growth marketer, whatever. And my sister makes cookies and I set up a site and sold cookies. Like it's, and we're making seven figures of revenue. So it's like, it's, it's, it's unreal how much more success I had doing something that I thought was, I would have thought was beneath me when people love cookies, who cares if it's just like a, it's like, Oh, it's not a big tech SaaS company. Oh, I'm not, I'm not featured on tech crunch. I'm not whatever. Like, I have more people loving my cookies than a lot of people have actually loving their stuff. Um, even if it's a, something they use all the time, it's just people are actually passionate about it. Um, and seeing all these little kids posting things like you see little kids enjoying it. And it's like their thing. They're going to grow. I remember growing up and getting ice cream from a certain place in my little town. And like, that's still a memory. People have memories of this thing that I built from their childhood, you know? So it's like, you can do anything random with some people, but just find someone who, has another skill in a different area um, and don't always go it solo and, and yeah, try to build something quick and don't waste time like building a big old thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I wish I would have done different. I think that's great advice. And I want to just reiterate it because I think it's, it's, it's so uh, it's understated. It's, it's, it's something people should think more about. Number one, if you combine your skills with somebody else, uh, just the number of combinations of things you can do just explodes ex- exponentially. If you're just like, I'm a developer, I got to write something with code. You know, there's not that many ideas that are going to come. But if you're like, hey, I'm going to pair with a salesperson who's an expert at selling this, or I'm going to pair with a cookie maker or something, they're suddenly like, you know, the combination of that means you can build something that's super unique that a lot of other people haven't thought of and aren't doing. So I think that's great advice. And then number two, you know, you don't have to have the fanciest, flashiest, coolest, newest thing. There's lots of things out there that people already know and love. People love cookies, like you said. There's a, a million things that people love. You don't necessarily need to innovate to find out what do people love. You can just look at what people already love and figure out a better way to bring it to them or a different way to bring it to them and sort of de-risk your business in that way. So I think that's super smart. And yeah, I you hope- don't have to, Like you said, you don't have to innovate. You just have to be better at, at something that people already like or be more convenient or just there's a, another... What make what gives you that competitive advantage, and then optimize for that competitive advantage? What differenti- differentiates you from other people? Um, and that's it, you know. Like- exactly. And it's it's frustrating because so, so many people are stuck on this. Like, I don't know what to build phase, and it's like the world is full of a million things that work really well. Just build one of those, but for you know an underserved group of people, or in a, de- a better way, or optimized. And you don't have to worry about what people love. Like the answer to what people love is out there. You have the answers to that test. Just go build it. Uh, Sam, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, I've been really entertaining to talk to you about your cookie business. Uh, can you let listeners know where they can go to find more about Crave Cookie and, and, you know, maybe where they can buy one if they're interested? Yeah. So, uh, we're at cravecookie.com. Um, we don't have online shipping yet. I've built it out and I tabled it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so it's, it's just a matter of time, probably in the next month. I'll probably add some online shipping so you can actually try these, but they're, uh, um, yeah, that's, it's basically, I don't, I, I'm not on a lot of social media. Um, I don't, I'm, I, yeah, I still, I read books by candlelight at night. Like I don't, I don't like things to be constant or overly stimulating. I like, I like being in control. And so, yeah, I, uh, I don't have a lot of social presence, um, online. Um, if, yeah, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I guess, um, send me a message or whatever. Um, if you have any questions, my email is sam at cravecookie.com. If you have any questions, um, yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. All right. Thanks a ton, Sam. Yeah. Thanks, man.